Charles Jimenez, who is uh, representing the British Opposition Party, especially in Great Britain, in our job, in addition to the responsibilities and connections to the British Opposition Party, Jose is also a uh, consultant in our job who has extensive experience in applying the methodology and implementing it <coughs> across uh, many sectors, such as the public and private sector and so forth. So I'll just try to hand it. Thanks, Isaac. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, yeah, so um, um, I don't want, I mean, it's not going to be a presentation. We could be, we could be talking um, about the, the challenges of introducing Agile for, for a very long time. So um, I've picked a few um, which are hopefully relevant um, and uh, just have a conversation. So anytime, please you know, interrupt and, and we can talk about it. Um, any questions about that? Um, hopefully, we, we can talk about some, some of those as well. Um, so, um, as you was indicating, um, uh, my background, I am a BCS uh, fellow and charter IT professional. I chair the BCS Agile, Agile Methods Group. Um, in, um, in the Agile space, uh, I work as an Agile consultant, Agile coach, transformation, um, organizational transformation uh, consultant. Um, and I am not, or we don't, we are not tied to one of the methods. So I work as a Scrum Master, a Scrum Product Owner. Um, I am a DSDM Advanced Practitioner. I am an Agile Project Manager Practitioner. And as the, the experience for, for us has always been that um, in order to make Agile work in, in an organization, an enterprise level, transform organizations, um, Sometimes just one method, it's not always the answer. It's about making or understanding what the context is of the organization and making agile work for that organization. It's a long journey and, and sometimes we just have to make sure that, that we, we work along the way with the organization. Um, uh, I work with RASTAC, which is a, a training consultancy delivery organization. We are agile, we work as an agile organization ourselves. Um, and with my colleagues, the experience we have had, um, public sector in particular, has been working with Metropolitan Police, and East Sussex Fire and Rescue, Home Office, blah, blah, blah. So um, different centers and that's training, centers in consultancy. Um, so we've got some experience in, in public sector as well. Um, so um, the Agile um, method, especially the group for BCS, um, was, uh, we created it this January 2012. Um, we have 500 members across the UK, BCS members. Um, as I say, we, have made, we want to talk about agile and agility. We are not particularly concerned about specific methods. Um, so we, we remain meth method neutral. And we want to talk about or promote uh, the awareness and, and how to use agile appropriately at the right time in the right way. Um, promoting good practice and, and supporting a knowledge community. So just making sure that as a, as a, the community can talk to each other because sometimes Agile can be, um, it could be lonely and you have challenges and it's never as easy as you, you thought when, when you know, the team said Agile is easy. Actually, that when you open the team, it's not that easy. Um, so we, we go a supporting community and we help each other and we, we share um, our successes and our um, Challenges, <laughs> in that way. So, um, just as a quick poll around here, um, have you? I mean, how many of you are using Agile? We went this before, but there's a few. Okay. Um, when you mention when you mention uh, to customers the word Agile or Scrum, are you getting any sort of like negative customer reaction within your organizations or external customers? Yeah, so um, there is an increasing trend that Agile is, um, we need to, we need as, a, as an Agile community, as an Agile profession, we need to live to the expectation that we have, we have created, okay? And there is an in a growing trend that we need to realize those promises. We need to ensure that there is a, a proven evidence that it works and how it well it works, okay? So, um, that's it. Um, have you heard um, the, the typical sentence, we tried Agile, but it didn't work for us. So we don't do it anymore. We've gone back to waterfall. 
Okay. Um, we hear, we've heard it. We're hearing it more and more. Um, normally, we will say when we when we go into it, we will say that probably what they were calling agile or what we've been calling agile hasn't been the sort of discipline agile or the sort of like committed change to agile that really really needs to happen. So, okay. Um, John was pointing it out. Um, conceptually, agile or the different agile methods are very, very simple. The Scrum guide is 16 pages. You can read it in an hour or so. It makes a lot of sense. It's very, very, very easy. Um, but actually, it's quite hard to implement. And I, want, I don't want to put you off by f going through the challenges of introducing Agile and saying that it's not. Actually, it is worth it. Um, it is, the rewards are, are exceptional when it works. And it's a lifelong journey. Um, real agility is not about doing agile that's what we do normally we can fail it's about being agile and it's about how we go about our professional lives um, so many times we talk about agile we can we can get too um, focused on the specific methods and doing stand-ups and doing this and doing that the real benefit of agile many times is about how we interiorize the philosophy agile is very much a philosophy um, which is supported and underpinned by methods and processes. Um, and it takes perseverance, it takes p discipline and focus. That's PDF, as I just <laughs> read it. <laughs> but it's a different kind of PDF. So, but it's a long life journey. Once you start doing Agile and you really go for it, you don't stop, you never stop. Um, with that in mind, there is, there is more reports that are talking about um, the barriers to, fo uh, to, to adopting Agile in organizations. Um, and, and they're very consistent. I mean, I, I, Agile, as a, as a, the manifesto was <coughs> defined in 2001, so 11 years ago. Um, all the theory, all the l you know, industry expertise that built Agile like goes back as, well, as, as back as 47 with, um, with Lean and the Toyota manufacturing system. So, but um, we're talking about companies that say, like, you know, the ability, the ability to change organizational culture. So we try to do agile, but we are not changing our culture. We don't want to change the way we talk, communicate, the way we work with one another. We don't, we don't change our behavior, really. And that is one of the biggest obstacles. Other one, general resistance to change. Change is difficult. Change is scary. You know, many times you go to organization and the first, peop the first thing that you hear is like, am I going to lose my job? Because Scrum doesn't say th th that you need a project manager. Am I going to lose my job? And so on. So um, novelty is difficult. And learning, learning things is always difficult. Um, lack of experience. Many times um, there is, there is a, a common mistake of saying, okay, we're going to send someone, one person in the whole organization to do a Scrum Master course for three days. That person is agile already, no. That person only has seen, you know, agile for a couple of days, um, or Scrum, or whatever it is. Um, and, and that's what we need. It takes experience, it takes help. It takes time, it's a, it's a, it's a journey, okay? Um, usually training is the beginning of that journey. Management support, and it's, Think about, you talk to talk, you need to do it as well. Um, um, sometimes it's some, uh, we, we have a belief that Agile is for the developers or for the testers to do, but not for the managers, not for the leaders. Um, except that we many times mirror our behaviors in how the leaders of our organization act and behave and communicate. So if those people are not acting, behaving, communicating, being agile, it's going to be quite difficult as well for the, for the rest of the organization to really follow up. What, you know, there is going to be a disassociation between what part of the organization does and what part of the organization does. Um, so, so there is, you know, sometimes you're with an agile without the support of the managers, and the biggest support of the managers is them embarking on the same journey with us, with the rest of the organization. Um, or creating ways of supporting that, if it's not possible. Um, 
Project complexity of size is another one. Um, customer collaboration. I mean, it's a typical thing with customers. You know, we sign the contract. Here is so much money. I'll see you in three years' time. By the way, when you give it back to me, I will not like it. Yeah, it's a typical thing. Um, about four, you know, 45% of the requirements that are specified at the beginning of any project are never, ever, ever used. But we still tend to deliver those. You're talking about um, before John about this part of the system that no one wants now. Um, so. Customer collaboration brings better results, brings better, um, obviously better systems and, 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 and you know, more, more satisfaction in the end of the day. Um, confidence in the ability to scale agile methods. Um, scaling agile is quite difficult. Scaling across the organization, making, making it's, it's easy in a way to have one team doing Scrum. It's quite complex to have 100 teams doing Scrum and working together making sure that the architecture is correct, making sure that the business architecture is right, that risk is there, is managed and all those things. It's doable, it's possible, but it's a lot, much, much more uh, complicated to do. Um, the perceived times of transition, again, this is something that happens, you know, you go to the course, you learn it, it's 16 pages, we can do it. You know, to, you know Monday morning was bank holiday, and Tuesday morning we'll go to the office, that's it. Yeah, we're all agile. Uh, it, it takes quite a bit of time. And are you familiar with the, with the, the curves of learning, typical curves of learning? I'll quickly draw it. So usually what, what happens with anything, with any change and any learning, is that it does time and does our sort of like our proficiency. We start at a certain level. And what we are trying to do is to get to a certain le new level, which is better than it was before. So we introduce a learning experience, teaching, coaching, mentoring, anything. And at the beginning, with Agile, for, with Scrum, for example, it looks quite, it looks simple, yeah? So learning something that looks quite exciting and is good and all this stuff. Then we start realizing that, uh, okay, I really don't know, real world starts hitting you, not sure. And we always have a dip what we interiorize and absorb that learning. And that dip eventually, hopefully, goes that way. And you finish, you know, somewhere, which is your new, your new level of expertise. Um, that happens at the individual level, that happens at team level, that happens at organizational level, okay? So when we are doing any um, transition, when we are going, moving from that expertise to that expertise, it takes time and it takes patience. And usually, also, you have to be able to have the patience to say, well, we might have a little dip, yeah? The key of any change program or any learning experience is to make sure that that dip is as little and shallow as possible. And if we don't manage that correctly, what could happen is that you end up forever there. So it was, it was a wasted effort, or actually detrimental even, yeah? Final one is uh, budget constraints. Let's do Agile, but we're not gonna put any money into it. So we're not gonna give you the training, we're not gonna do this, we're not. So it's, it's another one. Um, does those sound familiar, those, those sort of, have you heard things like that? Or do they make sense? They're not typical of Agile, but they're typical of, of many times of any change program. And we keep doing change programs and failing, and sometimes it's because that sort of thing. Um, where do you think, I mean, this is the curve of, of um, any innovation adoption life cycle, okay? So there is always gonna be the innovators that create or lead the first people that are, are, are forming the, the, new, the new innovation, Agile being one, for example. So these are sort of the guys that were involved in 2001 or before, even before, in, in the Agile rad, creating the manifesto, moving it forward. Then we have the early adopters that jumped into it quite quickly. Then you have the early majority. You have the late majority and the laggards. Where do you think Agile is today? Early adopters here. No. Um, you hear more and more people saying, and there are reports, and you know, Forrester did a report um, last year, saying like, well, Agile has become mainstream. 
And when we, become, when we say we become mainstream, we say, we say that we are in that early majority at least. So we're getting to, it's just becoming very popular. So we've gone the phase of the pioneers and, and things, and you know, the early adopters. And um, there was, the, there is a, a concept of co talk about crossing the chasm. And crossing the chasm for any product or any innovation like the iPhone was about the moment that it goes from those early adopters that just has faith in something that probably doesn't work yet and is not particularly good into something that the majority will work with. Um, and I think Agile breached that already, definitely breached that. Um, I think there is another chasm there between the early majority and the late majority. And, and it's a very big chasm at the moment. And that's where companies are trying it and they're saying it doesn't work for us. So we're gonna go back to what we did before. So there is a lot of people that are trying it. They are trying what we call fake agile because it's not proper discipline agile. It's easy agile, really, yeah? And, and it doesn't work. It, may, it looks difficult, it looks too much effort, whatever it is, too expensive. Um, but it's not agile, we're calling it agile, yeah? And that's why they're abandoning it. A few of them, okay, and, and it's, it's another chasm there. I mean, these guys are the guys that are still refusing to do DVDs because VHS is great, and DVD is not going to succeed anyway. It's new, yeah, um, that sort of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, uh, in moving from each one of them, there is always going to be a chasm, and, and it takes a lot of effort and a, a, almost like a, a change to make sure that we move from one to the next and be successful and make it, make it stick. Um, and right now, there is a lot of, or there is you know there is a certain element of we tried this, we didn't really got it, and we go back to what we did before. Um, this is, um, I'd like to talk about, because I would say that Agile is, a, is very much a philosophy, okay? Um, and if you look at the manifesto, these are the values in the manifesto, okay? So we're talking about, you know, it's all, in the end of the day, the first one is individual and interaction, it's about people and how we interact, how we communicate, how we talk to each other, how we collaborate, how we are self-empowered to, to be the best we can be. Um, in IT, it's an industry that there is, you know, there's very intelligent people. Really, really intelligent people. And we make lots, I mean, we have a horrible track record of delivery. How is it possible that very intelligent people have struggled to deliver? Yeah? And many times it's because we put the processes and the tools ahead of us. Yeah? Processes and tools on their own do not deliver value. It's the people that use those processes and tools, the ones that deliver value, yeah? So all these processes and tools are supposed to, th are supposed to be things that are enabling the people, the individual and the interactions to become as good as, as they are, to create the space for excellence, okay? Um, so the typical thing that we do, we're gonna do Agile, okay, I'm gonna spend 100,000 pounds in buying an Agile tool. Uh, you're just gonna straight into tools and processes. Yeah, you need to support. We, need, we sorry, we need to support the emergence of those individuals. Uh, allow those those individuals to emerge those interactions, to learn the interactions, to really master what agile is. Yeah, if we put the tools in there, what we end up doing is suffering from cargo cult. We have to follow what the tool does, without really understanding why. Why you know I've seen teams doing. Um, the 15 minutes daily stand-up, but not understanding why they're doing the 15 minutes stand-up. Or doing the retrospective, we'll call now retrospective by numbers. We just retrospect. Okay, but what do you do about it? Oh, nothing. Well, what do you do it? Oh, because it's in the, it's in the, in the SCOM guideline. You know, that, that's cargo call. That's doing it because the SCRUM process is telling you to do it, the framework. Um, we touched on this before, working software. Working software. There is nothing, you know, documentation will not give value. A 200 page manual of requirements or something like that about what we would like to do, there's not giving value. It's about producing the results. Now, you, c you cannot have working software 
if it's not supported by some good documentation. But it's not about this comprehensive documentation, it's how that docu documentation eventually happens. We might end up with probably quite a bit of documentation, but that documentation has grown organically with the system, with the working software. It's there to support and enable us. It's not, it's not the precursor of the software, it's the consequence of doing it. Yeah? So one typical problem that we have is that we say, you read that sentence, and especially, you know, I, I, I've been a developer, so I'll, I'll put my hands up. Wow, that means that I don't have to write documentation. <laughs> it doesn't say that. It says over comprehensive documentation. Yeah? Um, but it's very tempting to go and say, like, ooh, hippie camp. <laughs> you know, free for everyone. Just, just go and code. That's what I like. Um, it's very disciplined. You ha we have to be very, very disciplined. Um, customer collaboration over contract negotiation. We need to change. The is this is the typical, typical um, um, client-supplier relationship problem. You know, that you start talking with clients, or with, with, with you know, whether you're a supplier or a client, and the first thing we, we, start, we start doing is putting clauses in contracts. And it's all a lack of trust. It's all a protection. It's all about how I'm going to get you if things go bad. It's not about collaboration. What John was saying before, it's like you, just, you change the conversations. You change the way we do contracts. You change the way we collaborate. You know, we, we share the risk and we share the rewards. Yeah? We do things together in order to produce something better, working software better. And by the way, it says working software, it could be working any product. It doesn't have to be code. Um, but it's very important to have a collaboration. And then responding to change over following a plan. What happens with traditional uh, contracts when something, when something new is found? When, you, when someone forgot a requirement? Hmm? Mm -hmm. You start an addendum to the contract, the, the, the feared change control board, the, the, the supplier telling you, whoa, that's going to cost you. Oh, <laughs> do you really want to do that? <laughs> yeah. Um, in, in, in Agile, we embrace in change. Change is actually seeked and welcome. Yeah. Because um, basically what we are doing is like, why one of the big differences it was always because um, if we do, if we spend six months writing documentation, writing requirements, defining everything, all the architecture, I've put so much effort, so much effort into it, that for someone to tell me, essentially, I got it wrong, yeah, I've invested my whole professional last six months into this, yeah, and then I struggle with it, accepting the fact that I could be wrong, yeah. Um, if I just do it enough, if I'm doing things at the, ra at the last responsible moment, when is the time to do it, to bring the detail only when it's really needed, change is easy because, you know, you don't want that requirement, which is just written in maybe in three lines. <laughs> Fine, what do you want? Yeah, I haven't put any effort into it. I've not invested my, my life into that. Yeah, so embracing change is easy. Change is for free. Change is welcome. That's why the product backlog is really, whatever shape it takes, whether it's a, an application or it's an Excel doc, whatever it is, it's a live document. It's a live document which is growing with you, with the product, and the detail comes with it as we go along. So we're expecting change, and we are constantly um, replanning, we are constantly reprioritizing, collaborating with our customers. So that's why all these things that Scrum say, they're underpinned by these sorts of principles. And that's why I say that, you know, it's very difficult to do this. It's changing our mindsets. But the rewards are fundamentally brilliant. Okay? Any thoughts about that? Any questions? I must say, actually, mm. uh, just to underscore uh, Jose's Morning, you know, you can have on a post-it or, or um, you know, we even just got into 
an index card, mm -hmm. you know, really does, it's obviously there's not a lot of space on there, but there is enough to get down a specific requirement and it does sort of focus the mind. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you've got a blank Microsoft Word template, you don't start to just start typing forever and have quite long requirements. So mm -hmm. I think Agile or, or maybe Scrum has put a little focus on yeah. doing that. Yep. I mean, and there is all these things about the fact that we really don't, the, the, the false, the false economy in a way that we had is that by, by, by trying to document everything early on, we got a sort of like a, we, we built a self-assurance that because we put all this effort, it must be right. When we know that it's not right, we know that the real, um, some of the real change and the real knowledge is going to emerge when someone, people, when people start using the system. Um, there is a, it's a law. I don't remember the name. Is it law? But anyway, so, um, also the drawing. Yeah. yeah, the more I think about it, yeah, mm. like that, one thing mm. is that it's drawn in some research a long time ago now about, mm. um, about the risk involved in, in writing requirements. Because, you know, I started my life really as a system engineer. Mm. And in addition to, um, you know, lots of the risks uh, that you um, experience in, in your assistant drivers about it, Mm -hmm. um, now, I know from working with some people, um, you know, that some people are perhaps being used to an admin function system, mm -hmm. so they're getting used to sort of questions over that, but some people aren't. Mm -hmm. So it's a, quite a risk for those people, mm -hmm. and they might not, through no fault of their own, you know, they, they, they might be doing their best to express what they want, mm -hmm. but they, you know, they don't do it in a way in which it's going sure. to help us. Yeah. But the, the great thing about, I think, the Agile family, It emerged, yeah. And James, mm. you were earlier about organic experience, you know, mm. they're so organic and you mm. get this idea of you, you, you start to get understand the journey goes on. Absolutely. It's almost like, I mean, it's a, it's a very probably difficult comparison, but the product backlog, the requirements, it's almost like a, like a, like a small child that you need to take care of, you need to nurture so that it grows into a, into a, a, a successful person, okay? It's, it needs that sort of like, Tear and tender, uh, care and tender love, yeah, TLC, tender well. So, um, I got it wrong. <laughs> so anyway, um, moving on. This this is moving on. Yes. Um, principle manifesto. I'm just going to very quickly, but it, again, re reiterating all these things about satisfying the customer. If the customer wants X, and all the customers are telling you your 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 experience of what you know you put a piece of application there and you have customers saying they want this they want this they want this listen to them we need to listen to them because in the end of the day the customer is the one that's going to use the system if we ignore them we ignore them at our own peril we can lose them as customers they might be wanting something which appears to be on the face of it a bit silly but if you're consistently being told we want to do this in the end of the day, it's their system. Is the customer the one that is going to use it? Yeah, that might take. Could be, you know, argue against that. Um, continuous delivery of value, sustainable pace. So making sure that we can continue. We talk about sprints in Scrum. Um, it's not about running at full speed. It's about making sure that we can continue running for all, as long as we are. So this is not agile. Is not about one of the myths of agile. Is that people will work harder and work faster. No, they want to work better. And better doesn't mean faster. It means better quality, better results. Yeah? So that's a one myth. We're going to do agile because people are just going to do more. Sustainable pace, please. <laughs> technical excellence, non-technical excellence, embracing change, collaboration, simplicity, all these things. Um, and and these va the values and these principles, you will see them reflected in why we do things in Scrum the way we do it, or in DSDM, or in XP, or in any method. Yeah? They wouldn't be successful if they were not following this sort of thing, the philosophy. Yeah. OK, um, things that happen, problems. This is Forrester Report, uh, 2010, and they talk about water Scrum 4. Okay. Um, and one of the things that is happening, and, and again, this is part of this custom and all these problems that we can see, is that we go organizations in which the decision making 
is still being made traditionally. That's fine. So before, they, they, someone make a decision, they put a budget into it, they say you're going to do it in six months or else, yeah? and everybody just follow the, you know, the, the, the sort of waterfall model until it goes and is delivered and supported. Okay? So better or worse, that was a process, that was a way that people, the organization followed. Yeah? So now we've gone here, and a lot, a lot of it is in IT, and a lot of it is development. Yeah? And we said, no, we're going to do it different. So we could sort of like insert it in there, a different mindset, different ways of doing work. If we don't manage that, what happens is that we created there a divided line between our decision making, project before, you know, all the project ma management, um, financial budgeting, anything. Yeah? The way we deliver things, and then how we potentially test it, deploy it, support it. Okay? And, and I've, I've had managers, senior managers here saying, look, my teams are doing development, they are doing, they are doing agile. And they actually, yeah, they seem to deliver quite well, but I don't understand them anymore. We create barriers, we create a distance there of new language, new mindset, new ways of communicating. You have sometimes developers going to a CI CEO, if it's a small company, and telling them, forget about the way, I'm not going to write documentation. Yeah, I'm just going to do code. So we have to be mindful that by optimizing one part of the organization, we could actually be creating friction and a break within the organization. Yeah? So we have to be able to manage that. So for example, having, scrum, having prints and a scrum can be a good idea and it can work. Yeah, because you might still be doing some sort of a sprint product development, work, whichever way you're gonna do it, so you might be doing it. Yeah? But it's also very important that people outside of the scrum, your stakeholders, understand what you mean when you're doing this. Yeah, understand why we are doing what we do, why requirements are better to emerge, why we start with high level and we don't do big documentation, why it's better to do smaller contracts and you know deliver smaller pieces of work. These guys have to be aware. I mean, I was a, I was a development manager of a team uh, of thirty people, and we used to produce, um, and it was just developer. Um, we used to produce every two weeks working software, working software, working software. In there, behind us we had the testing teams, yeah? And we were drowning them because every two weeks, more code. Every two weeks, more code. And we had a break of communication there, essentially, yeah? So we ended up, we ended up you know, there was a bit of friction there as well. So you can, the, the risk of this and the challenge of this in introducing Agile is that you could be optimizing that too much without really making sure that it's also expanding beyond your IT. You need to, we need to reach out horizontally or vertically, whatever you want to say, as we are you know, improving the, 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 the delivery of the products. Does that make sense? Yeah? I don't know where you experience that when you try to do Agile or when you talk to other people about doing Agile. But it's, it's a typical, it's quite typical. I said this is um, Forrester Research, so you can read the, the whole article. Okay, I think that's the number. Thoughts on that? How much for time? Okay. So another challenge, building on that, is that many times people see Agile as a silver bullet. And you touched on this. So people go, I mean, there's a cartoon that says, just give me an Agile. How many kilos of it? Two kilos of Agile. You cannot buy Agile. Yeah? You might, you might buy a tool. I mean, vendors will go very simply, if you buy my tool, you can do Agile, all right? What they're telling you is what the practices and, the, you know, which bring you hopefully consistency, yeah? But without a vision that gives you the clarity of why we're doing this, why do we want to do Agile? Actually, what is the real objective and goal of doing Agile? Agile is just the mean. Yeah, it's better working, maybe. Better products, service in our community is better. Yeah, maximizing the way we spend our tax money, whichever it is. Yeah, um, one of the most successful agile companies, which is called Rally, they they produce a agile tool. 
but the vision they had is um, to make a better world. And they want to do a better world by making better software that helps people be happier. Okay, so that's a very, very idealistic aspirational vision. But that organization has grown with that sort of vision behind them. Yeah? Many times, we just go look at the what. So people do cargo calls, they're just doing scrum. Rather than understanding how we do things and why we're doing them. So, yeah, it's getting to make sure that we have a vision, we put the, the principles that give us the discipline to do it, and then the practices for the consistency. Yeah? If we only do that, people lose discipline because there is, they don't have a principle, they don't understand what we're doing sometimes, and we don't know what the journey is for. So that's one of the typical, typical, for me, m many times mistakes in many organizations of doing Agile. It, it, it's almost like Agile, you don't buy it, you, you leave it, you grow into it. How much scaring you so far? <laughs> it's good. <laughs> so um, there is the resistance of change. Um, this goes both ways, okay? Um, if someone goes and says, we're going to do Agile, this is a revolution, and, and there has been you know, uh, rumors around that, for example, organizations that say, we're doing Agile, so from tomorrow, all the project managers are you know, sacked. Okay? That is madness for any organization to get rid of personnel, domain knowledge, expertise, you know, people that have made that organization whatever it is today. Yeah? Um, but at the same time, um, introducing Agile means change, is, is the curve that we were look, looking at there. Um, in, order to do ch to, in order to do change, we have to change something. And in this case, it's going to be things about changing, changing the behaviors. So you've got managers that are still going to a room, an Agile room, and they start barking orders. Yeah? That's not going to work for self-empowerment or for courage. Yeah? If you have a customer that doesn't care what you do, you're gonna change, you know, I want that requirement now. I don't care if, if you know, you're doing a sprint, I'll change it now, yeah? Again, that's, that's not gonna help. So we have to be able to change our behaviors and our mindsets and the roles. It's very typical, I mean, and it's really, really typical to say all the project managers become scrum masters, all the BAs become product owners, and the most senior developer becomes a scrum master as well, so that it becomes a scrum master. Why? I mean, sometimes the best Scrum Master is a junior member of a staff. Because it's the person that can drive change, that can get, you know, it's personable, it's, 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 it's a little bit of a terrier, so we'll bite into a problem that will not really go until, you know, we'll not take no for an answer. It doesn't have to be a senior dev, or it doesn't have to be the project manager. Project managers can focus on managing the project, the governance, and the teams can ma focus on managing the delivery. Yeah, so the roles need to change as well or evolve. It's an evolution. Yeah, and eventually, if eventually, the most successful HR organizations end up. You work with HR, and you end up with a whole new set of job descriptions and and uh, roles and everything. Um, if we don't do that, we end up with the same or even worse results. And is the, I was talking, is this water, water scrum fall? Um, if we don't change the roles, if we don't change the behaviors, we create new frictions, we create new problems, or exacerbate problems. Yeah. So, and one of the things that we've said before in the, in the thing, that in management, man, management is not supporting things. If the management doesn't change, again, it's the leadership. Um, when I, was, uh, when I was a senior developer or a developer, I used to look at my managers and, 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 and I looked at what I liked from them or disliked from them in order to help me understand what I wanted to be in the future when I hopefully I got a promotion. Yeah? So people are going to always look up to, to other people. And if what they're seeing is, is bad habits or bad behaviors or unchanging behaviors, they're going to follow what those people do because somehow they got there and they are successful, or where, yeah. Um, one of the biggest challenges that I can see is ad hoc introduction of Agile. Um, 
and and that means sometimes like okay we're gonna we're gonna do a bit of agile we're gonna try just you know tiptoe into it we might not do this because it looks too difficult but we're gonna try to do something else so for example we, we might not do retrospectives we're only not gonna do scrums if we're gonna go into agile all the different um, all the different ceremonies, all the different products, all the different roles that are there are there for a reason, for a reason of specified in the manifesto. Yeah? They all support the becoming agile, the being agile. Okay? So doing ad hoc and just try, I'm not saying that you're going to say tomorrow we're agile, but it's tomorrow we're going to start trying our best to be agile and then we get better and we learn and we improve. Um, so sometimes we do agile and we don't train anybody. Yeah, we might just send one person, or or that person or, th or that team has to become agile. You have that deep as well, uh, but they do it on their own on top of their roles, their existing jobs. Yeah, so training, coaching, mentoring—it's quite important. Bring it back. One of the things that we said in the list of, of reasons, yeah, was um, not having enough expertise. Sometimes it's that expertise that helps say, like, this is how you do it. When things, when things go wrong, and you will go wrong different times, it's that expertise to say, whoa, 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 we can resolve it. In our context, a book is not going to tell us what the answer is for our problem normally. It's being able to say, well, in our context, this could be the right idea to move us forward towards the objective. Yeah? Insufficient experience, I just touched on that. And, and that risk of limited results, I mean, the, the risk of this is that we get limited results. And then people say, we're not going to do it. It didn't deliver what we thought. That's why we're saying that, well, what I call the second cousin. Sometimes people tried it, didn't work, they, they go back. Many times it's because of that. Okay. So one tip, and I, I, I've suffered that when I first did Agile um, for, for a fairly big organization. Um, I suffered that, that we tried it, we didn't really try it well enough, we didn't put enough training, we didn't, put, we didn't want to pay the expertise into the team, recruiting new people or bringing consultants, whatever it was. We just wanted to do it at zero cost, really. And we couldn't, we failed. Um, one thing that we could have done better, at least, at the very least, is to run it as a transformation project, where we could have gotten a few people in the organization that were more experienced or more versed into agile or had the right sort of like personalities and way of doing it and say for the next six months 12 months whatever it is you your job is going to be seconded into creating or helping us identify what agile is for our organization yeah so almost saying take you out from the job your job for for so long is going to be introducing agile because it's quite difficult to do all these things on top of our day-to-day -day job. Yeah? So that, that was something that we could have done. And when, we, when I do it now as a consultant, and we work on these things, you can see why it works as well, to, to, to bring people in and say, okay, let's, let's just work on it. Well, has, has anybody tried to do something like this, in, in, if not in Agile, in other type of change programs? Have you seen it done, the, the sort of like running a separate project? And it works better. People can focus on it. Do you?
-hmm. It can be. Mm. It can be too much too quick. It can be too much of a revolution. Um, sometimes we come up with the answer agile before we even know the questions. Um, and it's, uh, it's sometimes it's typical. I mean, if I, I get a new job and I'm expected to change things, and you know, you were saying in, in government at the moment, it, it could, agile could be the flavor the flavor of the month. So we, we you know, the answer is I'm a new CIO. I'm gonna do agile and open o open standards. A legacy project. <laughs> yeah. So, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, the important thing with, with, with change management as well is that you don't just throw away, you know, the baby with the, with the water, in a way. It's about, you know, you for, for me, for example, when we, we did, um, we were working with um, one of the divisions of capital. And, and it wasn't about going and saying, um, you're going to change it, you know, completely. Forget about everything you've done. Just, just we're going to change you. It was a question about understanding where they were today, creating that baseline. And then we said, okay, for, the newest, for the next 12 months, it takes quite a while. It takes easily. I mean, this is about changing the way we respond to problems. It's mental. It's a lot. So mental as, it's not crazy, but, you know, it's a, it's a mental process, a mindset process. Um, and, and we were saying, like, okay, you've got a challenge for the next 12 months. However, we're only going to be here for six. You have to finish the job yourselves so for the next six months let's get some of your people we're going to work with you and those people are not going to be the ones that basically are going to make me surplus to requirement and you finish the job you finish the journey oh you, you finish this stage of the journey you never stop but you know what i mean sometimes it's about it's having that that transformation project that <coughs> takes you from pl place a to place b or well more or less place b that will change as well you have to be flexible about that but if, if you start here and you say, forget about it, this is rubbish. We're going to go back there and I'm expecting to go there. Yeah? You need to start from here and go through that process. And someone's saying, like, you know, forget about everything that you've done today. It's rubbish. We're going to do something new. Get the baseline, grow into something else. Make sure that it's a journey. Okay. Is that all right? Yes. Um, I deal without essential enablers, okay? Um, without good product ownership, you don't know, if you don't know what you're going to deliver, then you won't be able to deliver, or at least you won't be able to deliver the right thing or something that customers want. So product ownership is great. It's essential. And, and sometimes we got organizations that are doing agile, but they don't really have a backlog. And they don't have a dedicated product owner. And they don't work with customers or stakeholders. But how on earth can you? And then they worry. They wonder why they are not getting the results that they thought they were going to get. Why the products are still not right. Yeah? You know why? Because we need to do product ownership. We need to put the time and the effort to do it. Um, Uncompromising quality is another one that is needed. I mean, Agile does not compromise on quality. It's about pride, professionalism, and excellence. So we, we are allowing the developers, the testers, the product owners, the project managers, everyone in the organization to be as good as they can be. Yeah? Um, if in, a, in an Agile environment, if you don't enable that, if you go and say, um, cut corners, don't test the system, just get it out because I have to take a box into a promise that I did. Yeah, We will end up compromising that in our, our ability to succeed in Agile. Or succeed, full stop, Agile or not. Um, not doing testing, again, testing is fundamental. I mean, in, in a lot of the things that we are doing because we are building things incrementally and we are trying to put it, ship it to the customers. So it's gonna, you know, hopefully it's every couple of weeks, every month, something else goes there. 
you have to have the confidence and you're not trying to manage everything or micromanage you're letting people to self-organize as well so you have to have a confidence that what we are putting to the customers works and that we haven't broken things so we there is always a bit more and a bit more and a bit more incrementally there yeah and the only way that i know or i can see that that, that happens many times is making sure that we have you know that you know the quality and the testing as well so we got a new system we automatically test it so that's what we're talking about you know continuous integration continuous testing automated automated testing and also usually organizations that again they could be struggling with with centers with agile is because they don't we are agile but we don't do tdd we are agile but we don't uh, we don't have any tests and and now we're putting this into the customers and we're having so many errors well it's no surprise that's not a problem of agile that's a problem of bad discipline and bad practice by the way um and so we're um Again, what I'm talking about so craftsmanship, craftsmanship is the, the counter thing is about not having the pride that a craftsman has in when, when you are producing a, a piece of wood or a piece of whatever, you know, you're creating a, a, a piece of art, whatever it is, yeah? I, I consider good software equivalent to a piece of art. It's a piece of, a, a, an application that works, that customers fall in love with and keep using. Um, the iPhone, for example, you know, you have some evangelists about it. That you know, people that will queue um, three days to buy the next one when it, you know, now in September comes out. There will be people queuing for days. Yeah, it's it's, it's generating that having that pride and that care in producing really, really, really good products. Yeah, if we don't have that, if we don't instill that into into our colleagues and ourselves. Again, we could just be producing bad, 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 bad software, bad application. So these are for me key enablers. There might be many others, but these are ones. Okay. Agile contracts. We talked about that before. I mean, I think uh, John did a very good exp explanation about like chunking them, making sure that there is a shared risk. I deliver you quickly. You pay. You know, if it doesn't work, we might just fail early and forget about it. It's changing the the conversations. When I have a when if I work with any client today or supplier. Um, and, and I have to go and refer to, you know, clause, you know, point 20, article 20, clause 17, B, Z, whatever. I know that something seriously bad in the relationship with that supplier or client is there. We, we really, really, really have to look at why we are there. So the moment that, the moment that someone talks, the contract says, <sighs> trouble, real trouble. Yeah? Um, Beware the scrundamentalist. A scrundamentalist, I love the word, so I have to use it. Um, but that could be um, the, the evangelist of any method, okay? Blind faith in what is written on the book, it's bad. Yeah? Agile is underpinned by continuous improvement. Inspect and adapt, become better, learn from our empirical results, our experience, okay? So when we become scrundamentalists and we go like this, yeah, we stop looking at the world around us. And that happens a lot in organizations. And that happens a lot, you know. Um, uh, I've seen consultancies, you know, that go there. So, Mr. Klein, you, need, you, need, you have a problem. The answer is going to be Scrum. And this is Scrum, the one that is in the book. It might not work for your organization. Yeah, but I only, you know, I've become so convinced and so much faith in this because it has worked somewhere else, probably. Yeah, that the answer now has become only this one. Yeah, so we lost the pragmatism. We lost the ability. I'm not saying that you lost the discipline. Yeah, but we lost the ability to look at the context and say what works for us into this journey. Where are we today to get there? Yeah, so beware the fundamentalism. Okay, um, and in that uh, in that thing we say. I mean, if you look at uh, Scrum in here, it really just covers um, delivery methods and a little bit of framework fra of governance. It doesn't really talk about engineering. Yeah? So it's typical to when people say we are doing, uh, and today when people say we are doing Agile, typically they're gonna s they mean Scrum. They're almost like interchangeable. 
okay? Uh, Scrum is the framework, what we do, and um, Agile is the, the, the philosophy, the principal values, okay? So when, we, when if we're doing Scrum, typically we also have XP underneath. It's almost like a, a, an, effect, uh, an, an accepted pairing, yeah? Um, but then you see people that are doing Scrum but they don't do in TDD or they're not doing refactoring or they're not doing the quality aspects of their, their, their engineering, okay? Um, there is another one, for example, DSDM, which tries to go from engineering all the way to governance. So it's a fairly robust, it's very, if you read the book, it's almost like a Prince tool type of book. Um, it's a good method, but it's a bit, it's a bit more, more mature and more robust. So it's difficult many times for engineers to, to, to buy into it. What you can have, what can happen, and now there is Agile PM, which is a subset of DSDM. Oops, I'm gonna fall. Um, so what can happen in the real world, yeah, is that you still have, <coughs> can you read that up there? No. <laughs> oh yeah, you can see it, it's black and red. Um, so you end up have, you have, you have things like, um, you have, may have Prince2 and RAP or ITIL or CMMI and all these things that already exist. We're doing a change program. It doesn't mean forget about Prince. It doesn't mean forget about, you don't throw those things. You can make all that, for example, work. And that's one possible example. There are many others, yeah? The important thing is that you eventually have with something that follows the agile principles, philosophy, values, um, but is your one, yeah? So when we were, for example, in, in again, going back to Capita, we, we were working with them to define Capita Agile. And it was very much, you know, based a lot around Scrum, yeah? But it was their solution for their journey, for to make their, their results happen. Sorry, Paul, like hmm. you're saying that it's hmm. It depends on your context. <laughs> so the answer is going to be it depends. Typically, I will say that localization is important. Yeah? If you have a green, a, a very small organization or, or a new startup where you can really shape it in which, whichever way you want, you might just go and say, okay, we're going to be a scrum, I'm going to go, and that's it. There is no baggage, really. Yeah? But normally, it's going to be, where do you, it's just that baseline. Where do you start? So you, I think you need to apply an element of we we are here today. We're gonna want you know we want to do it. So, so yeah, yeah, yeah. What is not compromisable is doing delivering all those values and principles in a way. Yeah. yeah. And if you're gonna do Scrum, make sure that you do Scrum well. But sometimes you have a Scrum with a bit of DSDM. You might have a Scrum with um, a Scrum and XP. Just not, not, it's avoiding getting narrow into just one, one there's only one answer, okay? Does that make sense, what I'm saying? Okay. Um, and it's a long journey. So we, we typically, many times we start with ad hoc applications of, you know, some of the practices. We then start harnessing, you know, agile and making more practices and making a bit more, if not formal, be more consistent or in a way that the organization understands it, okay? We use it, you know, more cons more consistent use of Agile. On we may start with one team, we make it more teams, yeah. But the eventual the, the eventual um, aim of a successful, sustainable Agile that sticks for the future will be that Agile enterprise, okay, where the business thinks and acts Agile. Okay, it's always been fun trying to get a CIO to stand up in a, in, a, in a daily stand up and say what I did yesterday, what I did today, yeah, and communicate with the user stories. There's nothing stopping a CIO saying, you know, as the CIO of this organization, I want to create, you say iPhone before, okay, so I want to create a new mobile, you know, I'm a telecoms company, I want to create a new, a new phone that will knock the iPhone off the market. There's, you know, and, and these are my acceptance criteria. Yeah, there is nothing stopping a CEO of communicating like that. And that's the great way because then the um, the, the actual detail of what he has there emerges over the next well, a new phone, maybe a year, two years, whatever it is. Okay. 
So going back to it, this, this is it for me. I mean, this is, this is what, this is the challenge of introducing Agile, but this is also the result of all this value. That's it. Thank you.